Speaker. The Honourable Phil Goff. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm pleased to support this bill. Um, I've got to say, there are some law and order bills that uh, the government from time to time comes up with, which are simply floss, they're designed to appeal to the electorate, but they're not really effective. And I've got no, I've got no time for that sort of bill. Um, I don't care, I don't care which party introduces it. Uh, I think we're only misleading the public when we pass legislation that's uh, all for show and has no effect. So when I look at a law and order bill, I look at it first of all in the light of whether this bill is going to be effective in meeting the purpose that it sets out to meet. And I don't look at it, you know, is this a, hard, a tough law and order measure? Is this a soft law and order measure? I look at it as to whether it's an effective law and order measure. And secondly, um, I look at it in the context of what our responsibility is as a House to protect victims and potential victims and to ensure the safety of the community. And on those two criteria, sir, this bill deserves to be supported. Um, from my point of view, I think this House always has to be on the side of the victim and stopping more people becoming victimised. Indeed, in the Parole Act and the Sentencing Act that I passed as Minister of Justice, the the determining criterion had to be risk to and safety of the community. So I try to look at these things consistently, regardless of which side of the House is introducing the legislation. So what does this bill do? It, first of all, it, it uh, removes legislative barriers to two forms of monitoring that were previously excluded from um, uh, two areas of offending that were previously excluded from monitoring. One is that area of offending where the sentence is less than two years, and the second area is where there was intensive, where there was a sentence of intensive supervision. Now there were two other areas that were also excluded, and the government clearly looked at these as well and decided that uh, uh, that uh, that monitoring of these sentences was not justified, that is supervision and release from home detention. And the reason why those areas weren't included was basically because these are at the lesser end of sentencing uh, and you could not justify the expense of monitoring, I think it's about $3,500 a year, uh, given the low level of risk, and you probably couldn't justify the intrusive nature of monitoring for those particular offences. But the two areas that we extended it to, you can. When you're sentenced to less than two years, you are automatically released after serving one year in prison. And regrettably, the level of reoffending by that category of offender, it might not be at the worst end of offending, but it's serious enough to put you in prison, and the high level of offending means that there needed to be another tool to manage the person who had been released after one year and still had one year uh, on parole. So it's really important that we were able to act in this area to try to reduce that high level of, of reoffending. The second area is the sentence of uh, intensive supervision. That's um, uh, obviously less than an, an imprisonment sentence. In fact, it's a less uh, less than a sentence of home detention. But there are a lot of people in that category where it was useful for justice and corrections uh, to be able to keep a watchful eye on the offender. Sometimes it was the sort of offender that, uh, because of addictions to alcohol or gambling, ought to be prevented from going to those areas that would contribute to reoffending. And it makes sense, a GPS system tells you exactly where that offender is. I suppose, although usually the sentence would be less, would be greater than this, uh, potentially a person that was at risk of sexual offending, keeping them away from an area. But most particularly, those that commit domestic violence offences, you can get a domestic protection order, 
Uh, but that's a piece of paper. It doesn't provide the protection that the victim or the potential victim of reoffending needs. And having a person on a GPS system that has uh, uh, been sentenced for domestic violence, again, the sentence would be helpful in that regard. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for these two areas, less than two years imprisonment and intensive supervision, monitoring is not automatic. It is still a decision by the judge in a court who independently decides that in these particular cases the additional instrument of electronic monitoring is needed. I want to put a caveat on the question of electronic monitoring. It is not a guarantee that the person will not reoffend. And I think the government also looks, needs to look at the level of breach of electronic monitoring that's currently occurring. You know, since 2008, sir, there have been 15 and a half thousand cases of people on electronic monitoring who have breached the order. Sometimes it's a minor breach, sometimes it's a major breach. But 15 and a half thousand breaches is a serious um, a breach of a uh, of a sanction that isn't working as well as it should. And I think the government needs to look more closely at that. In fact, we heard from the Department of Corrections last year that at any one time, there are between 20 and 47 offenders out in the community who have removed the electronic monitor uh, and are, are at loose in the community. Now, to put that in context, to be fair, that's uh, 20 to 47 out of 3,300 people that are on electronic monitors at any one time. It's not huge, but it is still significant. And it's significant to know that in 23% of home detention cases and 19% of uh, community detention cases, people are at some point in breach of those conditions. That is not a tolerable level of breaching a court order designed to keep the community safe. In uh, cases, I can think of the case um, of, uh, of uh, Tony Robertson. Tony Robertson actually wouldn't have been covered by this bill. He is the man that murdered Blessy Kotinko. It was an appalling murder. Everyone in this house would have had their stomach turned by the nature of the murder and the rape of an innocent victim by this man. And he, at the time that he committed these awful offences, was on a GPS monitor. That's evidence that the GPS monitor by itself does not prevent a person from offending. And if anybody in the House thinks that all you've got to do is monitor a person and you protect the community, they're wrong. The monitoring is only useful if it's backed up by the sort of supervision you need from your parole uh, uh, or probation officer and by a, uh, a program for rehabilitation dealing with the cause of offending. So the only thing that happened in the, uh, in the Robertson case was of course they could convict him because they knew exactly where he was and he was where the victim was and where the victim's body was dumped. But that is hardly a consolation to the family of that poor woman. So yes, this legislation helps, but it's not sufficient in itself. And you know, one of the things that appalled me, I've got to say, Mr Speaker, was that when I went to see corrections in the place that the monitoring was occurring, I said, why is it so easy to remove the electronic bracelet? And you know what corrections told me? They said, well, if it was hard to remove, what if it got caught in a piece of machinery and it put the offender at risk? Frankly, sir, that was a load of nonsense, and I'm glad that finally corrections in the government have moved to make it harder to remove the bracelet. I want to finish on the question of uh, inconsistency with the Bill of Rights, and I see the Attorney-General is in the House, so I don't know whether he's taking a call, and I know that uh, he doesn't personally decide that a, a thing is in breach, he is advised by his department, but to say that this, that, that extending supervision uh, by electronic monitoring is an unjustifiable breach of the Bill of Rights can't be right. It is a limitation on freedom of movement. It is classified as search and seizure, and sometimes people say wrongly that it's double jeopardy, but of course it is justifiable if it is helping to keep the community and victims safe 
when a person is regarded as being of sufficient risk to be electronically monitored. And I'd just ask the Attorney General to have a look at how the Bill of Rights is working in that regard, because it defies common sense to say that this bill is an unjustifiable limit on the freedom of the offender. Having said that, sir, with, uh, with all of the qualifications that I've made on it, this bill is worth supporting it, and the Labor opposition will continue to support it through the remaining stages.